Hello and welcome to the role of mentoring and transitioning to a first job. We're so excited to have you here with us. I have Bernadette Tavares with me. Uh, we are so excited to have this conversation. And uh, Bernadette is going to uh, pop back in later and then turn off their camera for now. But Bernadette and I are going to have a robust conversation about the work that she's doing uh, in Rhode Island. So welcome. Welcome, good people. We are so happy to have you all here. My name is Charlene and I work at Mentor National. I serve as the Senior Director of Systems Innovation for Mentor National. And while people are coming in, we would like to ask a question in the chat just to warm up the conversation for everyone. Uh, we'd love to know what was your favorite job or what is your favorite job experience and why? So if you don't mind putting that in the chat for us as um, folks come in share a little bit about what was your favorite job experience and why. And we'd love to know that about you as we begin. So we'll start the formal conversation and presentation in about one minute. Don't be shy, good people. I see you all out there. So feel free in the chat to share with us a little bit about you. What was your favorite job experience and why? And while those answers are coming in, I will share a little bit about my first or favorite job experience. Um, I think it was a Freudian slip because my first job was my favorite job experience. When I was young, I think it was about 14, I worked under the table at a, a telemarketing organization and I sold magazines. And the rationale as to why I got that job was I wanted to buy my mother a Mother's Day gift without you know, asking her for money to then turn around and buy her something. I wanted to earn it um, myself. And why I really liked that job is because it taught me a lot of phone etiquette and like the intonation and inflection of your voice and how important it is. So that ends up being my favorite job. Um, it also taught me some lifelong skills, right? That I still use now, obviously not 14 years old anymore, some skills that I still use now. So that's my favorite job experience. Please let us know in the chat, what was your favorite job experience and why? So feel free to put that in as we begin uh, the conversation. So again, this webinar is an opportunity uh, to feature a professional, Bernadette Tavares specifically, and talking about um, how mentoring can really facilitate a transition to a first job. So Bernadette will share um, some examples of existing partnerships uh, within their organization and how uh, her organization supports young people in their transition to the workforce. So we're super excited uh, to have her with us. Uh, it goes without saying, uh, but workplace mentoring is really essential to closing uh, gaps and opportunities and really creates important mentoring and networking experiences for young people while they're navigating their professional and career goals. So you're going to uh, hear from, from Bernadette, who is um, really excited to have the conversation with us and have you all here to listen about why workplace mentoring matters and the role of mentoring during a job transition. So thanks again for being here. We're hoping uh, to share a little bit about mentor, what we do, and emphasize why workplace matters. So on the next slide, I want to introduce Mentor to you, for those of you who may not be as familiar with our organization. So at Mentor, we believe that potential is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And a major driver of healthy uh, development for young people is who you know and who's in your corner. And so 30 years ago, Mentor was created to expand opportunity for young people by building up the youth mentoring field and the mentoring movement. We serve as an expert and providing uh, go-to resources, high quality evidence-based practices. And we are honored to share with you that the result of our work has been more than a 10 time increase in young people being engaged in mentoring relationships. So in our 30 years, 30 plus years of work, we've went from serving hundreds of thousands hundreds of thousands to now millions. And again, uh, emphasis of our work is providing evidence-based practices and high quality research for the mentoring field. 
I think it's also important to note that Mentor recognizes that systemic and growing inequities really manifest themselves as gaps in opportunities, networks, and access to adult relationships outside of the family units. So today, we activate a movement that uh, is across as many sectors and is as diverse as, and as broad as all of you wonderful people here participating with us. So we pride ourselves on being able to connect and fuel opportunity for young people everywhere they are, from workplaces to schools to sports fields and beyond. So at the top of the call, I introduce myself, but just in case some more folks just jumped on, my name is Charlene and I serve as the Senior Director of Systems Innovation at Mentors National's Office. And my work really focuses on supporting industry professionals and making a profound and endless investment in diversifying their talent pools. I also believe that young people really need equal access to opportunities that leverage their strengths and abilities to allow them to grow into a career. So workplaces that center relationships and mentoring really provide young people a sense of belonging and that they really need to realize their long-term career potential. So our systems work really emphasizes that relationships is a common thread from kindergarten to career, as well as any interventions that may happen along the way. And all the caring adults along the way have a critical role along that journey of a young person. I noted that Mentor is really excited to amplify the movement with tools and supports. And specifically, when we think about our systems innovation work, we are focusing on amplifying tools and supports for our education systems, our workforce development systems, and our corporate partners. So I want to share with you a little bit why workplace mentoring matters. And on the next slide, you'll see a few stats from our uh, power of relationships research. Uh, it's important to note that mentors research really found uh, that those who were at salary level positions or above are likely to report having a mentor of their own when they were young. And specifically, that's figure 21 on page 19 of the power of relationships research. So we can infer that the wisdom and guidance that mentors play in the lives of employees um, really help them get to where they are today and um, emphasizes really that mentoring plays a positive role in advancing someone's social capital. Mentors research also shows that just over a third of all adults, 37%, feel it's important for companies to support mentoring. And this rose to 58% for those working in companies that already had a mentoring program. So not only do we know that our nation's workers want corporate America to be more involved in mentoring, uh, we know that when they do, actual rates of mentoring dramatically increase in their communities and in employees reporting greater job satisfaction. So with that information, our workforce development initiative at Mentor really focuses on developing a mentoring mindset for industry professionals because they really have the power to increase positive outcomes for young job seekers that are not traditionally seen as candidates. And how we're doing that um, is our Connect Focus Grow training, which is illustrated here. So with our Connect Focus Grow training, it really prioritizes relationship building, goal setting, uh, growth mindset for managers of young people, mentors of young people, uh, and young people themselves. So our curriculum is interactive in its design and it aligns with effective adult practices for learning and positive youth development practices. So in Connect Focus Grow, we really emphasize that mentoring mindset by practicing professional curiosity. Uh, we look at cultural humility through the lens of self-awareness. We focus on helping young people identify their assets and prepare them to expand their networks. And we also explore the theory of growth mindset and that success is an iterative process. So again, this curriculum is designed for managers of young people, mentors of young people and young people themselves. So with that said, I'd love uh, to introduce uh, my amazing colleague who's come to talk with us, Bernadette Tavares. Uh, so Bernadette, if you don't mind turning on your camera, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you uh, on the line. And Bernadette's gonna introduce the work that uh, she does in Rhode Island. Um, and so we're really excited to welcome Bernadette to the conversation. Thank you so much, Charlene. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Bernadette Tavares. I am the Director of Career Pathways here at Foster Forward in Rhode Island. Um, I oversee the Workforce Development Program, which we have titled and named and trademarked as Works Wonders. Um, and we serve young people ages uh, 14 to 26 um, that have systems 
um, involvement. So whether they're involved in the child welfare system, uh, juvenile justice, or experiencing homelessness. I appreciate that a lot. Thank you, Bernadette. So Foster Ford, again, is, an, is out of Rhode Island and mentor, does have an affiliate in Rhode Island, Mentor Rhode Island, uh, led by Joanne Schofield. So we're super excited uh, to have Bernadette here with us. And we know that some of Bernadette's colleagues are on the line. So please feel free to let yourself be known in the chat. Um, as me and Bernadette have this conversation, we want to remind you all to please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions that you might have around Foster Forward uh, and best practices around supporting young people and transitioning to their first uh, job. Uh, so the first question I have for you, Bernadette, is can you talk about the specifics of how your program prepares uh, mentors uh, for young people transitioning to their first job? Absolutely. So um, the young people um, specifically uh, come through an initial training with us um, that is covers sort of those soft skills like resume building, cover letters, so on and so forth. But we also dig deep in with them to talk about their um, specific uh, goals for success for themselves and their interests um, in their careers. Uh, so we meet with the young people to make sure that we are collecting all of that information. Once they complete the training, they're assigned to an employment specialist who works one-on-one -on -one with them to kind of reiterate what was um, reviewed in the training, but also works with them to really dig in on those um, interests that they've identified so that we can start to connect them to employer partners within the community um, and create um, explorational and um, career ex experience, um, experiential learning opportunities mm -hmm. for young people. Thanks so much for that. And how do you pair um, mentees and mentors in your program? What's so, important for y'all to like consider in that process? So um, we work with the young people, as I mentioned, to um, do a career service, career interest service in inventory. It's called the RIASEC. Um, and it asks them a series of questions of, of things that they like and don't like doing, um, and then translates that information into um, different uh, focus areas with jobs that would be under those focus areas. Um, once we get a sense of what the young people are interested in, we match them up with our partners in the community based on those interests. Um, and we also, um, in, in terms of mentoring overall in our agency, we're really working with the young people to be paired with other folks that have like interests. Um, we know that with young people, it's really hard to engage um, with people that you, you're not familiar with, but it's really easy to start a conversation with something that um, interests the both of you off the bat. Thanks so much for that. And I want to learn more about that assessment because I'm familiar with ONET online, right? Like from the Bureau of um, Labor Statistics uh, here for the United States of America. But I'd love to learn more about that assessment and, and what that entails. Yes. So the RIASEC is um, an ONET product. Okay. Um, and the young people, um, as I mentioned, they're just asked all of these series of interests um, questions. So do you like to paint? Do you like to draw? Do you like to sing? Do you like to dance? Um, so on and so forth. Um, and then those likes and interests are tr translated into career pathways. Um, and that um, tool is used throughout the, the entire time that young people are receiving coaching to constantly inform how we should be um, placing them in the community. That's super helpful. I also think too, when you mention um, that assessment and, and kind of um, tool at Mentor, our colleagues at ASA have a tool, uh, Futurescape, which has kind of gamified um, kind of the assessment, career assessment process. So Futurescape by ASA, we'll try to put that link in the chat, is also an interesting way for young people to kind of take a quick assessment of what their interests are, just like you were mentioning. And um, the results come out in actually these um, kind of almost like galaxies and spheres, which is really cool. So like the the core kind of galaxy is is the the industry, right? Uh, or for me, the sector, and then it goes specific to the industry with little planets, um, and then satellite moons awesome. and stars for the jobs. It's really cool. I'll try to put that um, in the chat as well. But I appreciate you sharing that resource because it made me remember about the ASA resource. Um, I'd love for you to share with me a bit about some like practices and strategies that your program has implemented to really help facilitate transition for your young people that are entering the workforce? 
Absolutely. So um, many of the young people that are involved in our um, program, the first uh, point of interest that we want folks to know about them is not necessarily that they are systems level youth. We don't put a major focus on the fact that they're involved in the child welfare system or that they're homeless. Um, more so, we put more um, emphasis on a lot of these young people are young adults and they're stepping into the world of work for the very first time. Um, Works Wonders started off as a five-year research project. And one of the biggest takeaways that we've, um, we took away from the evaluation was 60% of our participants reported never having a first job by mm. their 19th birthday. So. Um, many of the young people that we're working with haven't been afforded the same opportunities that maybe you and I have. For example, I can say I started working when I was 14 or 15 um, in fast food and babysitting, and many of the young people that we're working with have not um, been fortunate enough to have those same experiences. So they're going into career pathways um, and entry level with um, this level of expectation that they already know the rules of teamwork and um, how to dress professionally, and many of them have not had that experience. So we have um, a network of approximately 50 employer and educational partners that we work with, um, and we have the ability to pay young people to do what we call experiential learning. So um, something as simple as an informational interview to ask professionals what their jobs are currently, what, what the day-to-day -day looks like, um, where they started off and how they got to where they are. Um, the basic job shadow that you all are probably familiar with. So spending a day with someone to see the daily interactions that they encounter and what that job actually looks like. Um, and then we're also able to pay young people to do um, sort of the minimum threshold we would say would be 40 hours of a hands-on work experience or internship um, and as much as 220 hours of a hands-on work experience. Um, and again, that, that placement is determined based on the interest and the need of the young person. Um, we really dig in with them to try to figure out if there are any barriers that are preventing them from being able to obtain um, or maintain employment and work with them to try to, um, you know, eliminate some of those barriers. So if we need to help them with transportation for the first couple of weeks to make sure that they are getting to and from that opportunity, we will certainly help with that. Um, we realize that our state's um, uh, child welfare system will not pay for child care for folks that are doing um, temporary work. So we will stipend them so that they're able to pay for childcare so that they can really truly engage um, in this opportunity and make the best of it. Um, we, we, many of our young people go through this experience um, and our employer partners, if they have the capacity, are able to test out those candidates and even onboard them um, for full-time or part-time employment. Um, more permanently. Uh, and we've definitely have, have some employer partners that have said that they would not have otherwise considered those candidates uh, for the positions that they ended up filling, um, especially in industries like the construction fields where, um, you know, the workforce is typically folks that are older, more groomed, um, and, you know, now with the change after the pandemic, many people are starting to pivot to younger folks, but really have to see them um, in, in the workplace mm -hmm. and see their capacity to be able to do that work. So yeah. and I love the compliment that I'm like, I'm hearing from what's happening at Foster Forward to like what mentor is trying to do. So when you're, when you're sharing about like with the construction industry um, and how young people have an opportunity to work with uh, the construction industry and, and, and adults or other seasoned professionals are like, oh, wow, like this candidate's really great. You're, you're starting that systemic change, right? Where you're broadening the candidate pool and providing young people an opportunity to explore the work to see if they like it, but also helping these caring adults uh, realize the emerging workforce. Right, which is which is critical, right? No one's going to work forever. I pray that no one on this line will work forever, right? So the emerging workforce, we have to be able to support them and prepare them. And I love that you're, you know, doing systemic change by introducing it slowly and steadily. Like that's a, like a sustainability model that I'm feeling and hearing. 
Absolutely. And we reach out to our employing partners on a consistent basis to say, you know, what has changed? What help do you need in your agency? Um, because we want it to be beneficial on both sides. We want the employer to be able to get the support that they need, but we also want to create realistic opportunities for the young people to truly learn about the industry um, and, and broaden their understanding of what options are available. They might say that they want to go into construction, but they don't realize all of the different levels and all of the different opportunities that are available in that industry. Um, so we want to create opportunities for them to, to try it out in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm also hearing too, kind of what I was noting at the top of the call, like mentor really focuses on supporting the caring adults in, in industry professionals and better understanding um, how to build healthy relationships at work. You know, there's that opportunity, not only for the young person to enter the workforce, to explore it for the uh, workforce professional to get to know a young person a little bit better, but there's an intentionality that we can provide as youth development uh, folks to really make sure that the mentor mentee experience is something that's healthy and memorable so that next time you go to that same employer or the next time someone approaches that employer from the youth development uh, sector, their eyes are a bit more open and they're a bit more willing too. So I really feel like Foster Forward is, is starting to do that, that make that impression in Rhode and Island. So it's really exciting. thing that I would like to add that we probably haven't highlighted just yet in the conversation is mm -hmm. having the employment specialist mm -hmm. be a part of that process um, creates a, you know, a middle man process for the employer, but it also has a trusting caring adult that has been working with the young person that you know, if, if Bernadette does not show up for her shift and didn't call, um, the employer can reach out and to the employment specialist and the employment specialist might be able to say, you know, her car got impounded yesterday. We're working with her to get that out. She wasn't really comfortable sharing that with, you know, with you just yet. Mm -hmm. um, or if the employer notices Bernadette shows up and she doesn't have the right clothing, again, they don't have to feel the burden of like, this is not an employee. There's, this is a little bit awkward um, of feedback for me to share. They can share that again with the employment specialist who's built the rapport um, with the young person and can give them that feedback in real time and guide them through that process. Um, so I would say having the employment specialist um, sort of in that mentor um, mm -hmm. role has been a really, really strong um, part of our program and has helped um, the young people immensely. I love that. I love that there's an employee, employment and employer coordinator. I think it's also important too, as that coordinator gets to know um, the industry professional better, right? They can encourage them like, here are some healthy strategies. Here are some healthy tips um, around how to engage with this young person so that there is like that systemic improvement and change in the industry, right? I think that's also important and critical, but I love that there's this uh, strong intermediary uh, in the meantime, while the young person and the professional are building up their relationship. It also demonstrates too, frankly, increasing a young person's social capital, right? They're maybe initially really comfortable with their employment coordinator, um, but then they learn to get comfortable with the person that they're working with too. So now they know two caring adults, right? We're, we're multiplying that factor, which is super exciting. I think also, Bernadette, you mentioned earlier, like wraparound supports. And I was hoping you could tell me more about like, who do y'all work with wraparound supports? Is it all at um, Foster Forward? Do you work with other nonprofits? Uh, so I would say both. Uh, internally, we have a ton of supports um, available here at Foster Forward. We have a financial literacy program um, that young people are immediately connected to once they um, complete the training and begin working with their employment specialist. Um, and that, um, that financial literacy program is a national program um, supported by the, um, the Annie and Casey Foundation. And those young people have a unique um, opportunity if they're in Works Wonders and in Aspire. Um, in that financial literacy program, they're already eligible to match dollar for dollar up to $1,000 every year for a durable asset. Yeah. But um, additionally, by being part of the Works Wonders program, we um, have done some equity strategies to try to match them um, and do what we call a triple play. So they'll be matched, they'll save the thousand dollars, they'll be matched on the financial literacy side, they'll also be matched through Works Wonders. And now they can, they have a better option, they have three thousand dollars to go find a better car. Um, and we know that when young people 
have a reliable reliable vehicle, they tend to be able to engage in more high wage, high growth opportunities um, and have a better chance of, you know, making I, a better living wage. I love that. I love that so much. And for so many reasons, like I think it's really important in a nonprofit space that we're working together and we're collaborating. I think the older I get, right, in this in this industry and in my career, you know, you see some, um, you see programs that kind of like, you know, mimic each other or, or they're, they're offering a lot of the similar services. So I love that Foster Forward is kind of uh, showing and demonstrating that model that if we all work together, right, and uh, use our collective equity to support young people, therefore they'll know that the whole community is on their side. And I love the opportunity for economic equity for young people to um, get their funds matched. Can you like break that down for me one more time? It's like if they're a part of one program, there's a certain uh, yeah, support so system. the financial um, literacy program has an asset match component. Um, they are able to match dollar for dollar up to a thousand dollars every year between fourteen and twenty six for a durable asset. Nice. Um, and that program has been running, and and it is actually the reason why we created our workforce development program. We had tons of pe young people involved in financial literacy mm -hmm. and we noticed they weren't matching and saving. And when we looked at the data, we realized many of them weren't employed. So how can they match and save if they're not employed? Mm -hmm. um, and so putting the two of those programs together to kind of tackle that um, financial barrier, especially, I mean, Rhode Island is a very small state but transportation is a big issue for mm. a lot of our young people. Um, additionally, I mean, we, we have mentoring um, specifically focused programming here um, mm. through our Rail Connections Mentoring Program. And we make sure that um, this, is, this is why this webinar was such um, close and dear to my heart. I started off working in that program um, and I've made intentional effort to make sure that we are um, modeling that mentorship opportunity for young people and connecting them with people that have had those experiences and can lead and guide them um, through their career interests and options um, as they grow in their, their profession. I love it. I love the double down. Um, I hope someone triples it down. Like it, the, <laughs> because if we think about economic equity and you know young people who um, have already been through enough uh, and and frankly need the supports to be on the same playing field as, as other young people, it's important that young people can uh, can obtain resources such as transportation that is autonomous, right? So that, you know, it isn't, oh, you know, Charlene was waiting for the bus and the bus never showed up. So she got frustrated and this was like, I'm, like, I'm probably not gonna make this shift, you know, like, like yeah. if we can reduce those barriers or minimize them, just like you're noting around childcare supports too. Um, I think it's super critical and super important for our young people's uh, professional trajectory and benefits. I got I got more questions for you, so I won't harp. I won't stay, <laughs> I won't stay here. We can but stay I, there forever, right? <laughs> we could around like economic equity for young people. I could stay there. I, I could stay there for a real long time. Um, I, have, I have a question for you around, what is your program gained from developing a mentoring program specifically? What is Foster Forward gained? Like we have wonderful, oppor wonderful opportunities and, and connections with, um, other programs who support uh, young people in different systems, but specifically, what is Foster Forward gained from developing a mentoring program? Well, I would say um, the population that we serve is the most vulnerable population um, nationally. So, um, young people involved in the child welfare system, many of many, the older they get and the longer they stay in care. Um, tend to end up in congregate care settings. So whether it's a residential facility, whether it's a group home or um, a juvenile justice system. Um, and many of those young people are deprived of the um, interactions with unpaid caring adults um, that just support them. Um, and, you know, the, the gain that we have is making sure that these young people have someone that they can call and bounce ideas off of um, that's reliable and can come and do just the simplest things with them. Um, I always give the example, we had a young young man that was paired with a mentor and they set out to find the best burger in Rhode Island. Um, and based on that very simple um, interest, they were able to really focus on getting him um, 
you know, to do better in school, um, starting to look for jobs at maybe some of those burger shops that they passed by. Um, so really helping the young people to build that social capital, um, build their network, um, and understand that there are folks out there that are willing to help them um, and give them that, you know, leg up that they need, really. I think you mentioned a lot of important qualities of, of high quality, healthy mentoring, but I also think very importantly, it's important for everybody to know the best burger in Rhode Island is Harry's in Providence. That's just what it is. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to have to make it over there. I still have it. I keep hearing this. So, <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> Hopefully that's a shameless plug. We can get, you know, we can get some credit for throwing that out there. <laughs> Hopefully Harris is listening uh, to us, but nonetheless, I think what you noted uh, was, was like a, an interesting point too around when we allow ourselves to be just open and, and like, you know, professionally vulnerable with young people, like you, you could do some really fun things, right? So something is, as, um, as I guess, is, is easy to talk about as a, as a burger or as a meal, right? Uh, could lead to so many cool open door opportunities. And it reminds me really of kind of a bit of what we do with our Connect Focus Grow curriculum, we're really focusing on helping caring adults, you know, the mentors of young people, the supervisors of young people, and the young people themselves think about how do they have um, healthy relationships? How do you ask open-ended questions? And if you're already good at that, just gentle reminder about that and how that can help lead to a really healthy and robust conversation. Uh, so you can ask, how you doing, right? And in these days, it's a really charged question. It is. <laughs> when we took the question, right? To be like, Bernadette, what brings you joy, right? It's like, ooh, that's, that tickles, that tickles me in a good way. I want, I want to answer that, right? I want to think about that. That's and it also uh, lets the young person go as far as they want to go, right? If they're not feeling like they know you yet. Um, and it's a question a young person can, can ask the mentor. Because a lot of the times too, right, a caring adult goes through their work day and no one has asked them <laughs> what brings them joy. So there's, there's duality in mentoring too, I think, uh, which is a really cool opportunity that you all are, are lifting up at Foster Forward. That's a great point. I mean, um, we start off our workforce development training um, talking to young people about what their hopes, fears, and challenges are. Um, and really and truly and honestly, like the, the way to build that relationship with young people to really like the workforce, stepping into the workforce is a scary place. I tell young people all the time, I'm, I'm a professional. I've been doing this for 20 something years. <laughs> um, and every time I step into a new um, employment opportunity, I have some fears and challenges that I'm dealing with as a, an, a, an adult. So if we can set the stage and start having conversations that are less difficult to build the rapport, then when we get to the part that's a little bit scary, it's going to be easier to navigate um, with young people. No, that's that's super helpful. Um, I have one more question for you, and then I can see in the chat people are very interested in, in what you have to say and what's going on with, with Foster Forward. Uh, my last question for you is, what would you like to see changed about the ways that um, youth are engaged uh, in entering the workforce? What would you like to see as the future of work place mentoring programs? So that is a very challenging, but yet easy um, answer for me. Um, if I had to say what I would like to see for youth entering in the workforce, I would say um, our big hairy um, North Star goal at Foster Forward is to have Works Wonders be the nationally preferred model for disconnected youth um, connecting into the workforce. Um, we never set out for the workforce development program to help young people get jobs. We really wanted to help them um, explore and experience in a safe way um, the things that we had the luxury to do as young adults um, and really learn and make informed choices about what they would like to do and then learn what the appropriate um, entry level and laddering opportunities are available. So um, for this population, I mean, um, it, this model has been proven to be um, successful with the most disconnected youth. Um, and so we really, we would really love to see, um, our program is open for replication. We have um, two sites nationally, one is in Nashville, one is in Indianapolis. 
um, and we're, you know, excited to continue to see the work grow um, and just continue to see young people have the support that they need to be successful. Thank you so much. And I know that um, Mentor's website, we had added the link because you were kind enough to, to share with us the brief on Works Wonders and the introduction on the program. And so that's um, a link in the chat for folks. I also wanted to ask you, sorry, I'm, sli I'm slipping in one more, one more piece <laughs> around to, um, is there anything you want to, guess, I guess, lift up about the power of community employer relationships and the significance that that has played uh, for Foster Forward? Any concrete yeah. examples that you want to share? Yeah, I would say, um, I think this just created an opportunity for people to think differently about the workforce. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, many of our employer partners have never not, they haven't considered hiring young adults because th their initial response to us was they're just not ready for this level of the work. Um, so going into the construction field um, is something that, you know, they tell us 25 and older um, is usually the population that that does well with the structure mm -hmm. and the discipline. Um, and I think creating this opportunity for folks to take a chance and say, the young person might not like it. They might not be a good fit. Um, and that's okay. Let's just create these opportunities for people to test it out and see what fits. Um, I think that is such a valuable experience um, and really part of what helps when you have community at the table. Um, just I that, agree. that opportunity. I mean, I had that with my parents, but um, many young people don't have those same opportunities. Um, so when given that opportunity, I think we'll see great things happening and across all industries because yeah. uh, these young people have just great potential and could do anything. And we want them to know that. Right. Just like we said, a mentor, potential is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. Right. And I love that you had that with your parents. I um, I did not, um, not for like uh, traumatic re reasons. My mother um, was widowed really young and um, I'm a first generation American. So she was just trying to acclimate, right? And uh, first generation college attendee as well. So she's like, I'm happy that you're doing that and I have no clue how to help you, right? So there's an opportunity for uh, mentoring to really uh, come into place to, to complement what's happening at home um, and also for employers to really step up and uh, bring an opportunity to a young person, it, it frankly com it frankly provides more of the, not just an understanding for the industry and for the job, but people remember the first brand that they worked for. Right? Like I remember the telemarketer I had worked for um, and the experience I had. I also remember, you know, working at a pizza shop when, when I was young too. You know, that one was not as fun. So we won't right. mention <laughs> who they are. But you you remember these experiences, and I think it's really critical when you have. Uh, community organizations and employers working together, uh, remembering that at the end of the day, our young people will be our leaders, right? This is the emerging workforce and we want to do what's best for them. So I think- One of our young people surprised me yesterday because Tell me. she would have said this earlier, I would probably have dragged her into this webinar, um, but she she said, something that you guys don't know is the the mentor that you guys matched me with um, was somebody who was in the nursing field because I was interested in the nursing field. Um, we recently had known that she was no longer interested in the work nursing field, but she did say that um, after conversations with her mentor, she found out about other opportunities that are um, available in that field, and she has decided to return to school. Amazing. So those connections do matter. Those conversations mm -hmm. absolutely matter um, with people that are experts in that field. I'm not an expert in that field. So my conversation with her might not have um, brought her back to school, but that um, that conversation very simply over dinner um, yeah. was something that was valuable enough for her to-, to Simple really and authentic, simple and genuine too, right? Exactly. Like that's the part that's really important because our young people can tell the difference. They really can and, and they'll call us out on it too. Sure I love won't. that you shared that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you shared that. That's going to give me warm and fuzzies for the rest of the day. I appreciate you sharing that. Have many of those. 
I, I love those. Later. I love those anecdotes. They keep me going, like when I hear beautiful stories across the nation to remind me, you know, that significance. Like we do the research, but to, to hear what's happening um, in people's local states and cities, it, it really is uh, exciting for us, for us here, to, here to listen and hear it. And we appreciate you, Bernadette, for your time and for sharing about Foster Forward. If you have a chance to uh, put Foster Forward's website in the chat, we'd love um, that. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, there was a question in the, in the Q&A function, but there's also one in the chat. So I think we're going to go with the one in the chat first, uh, just because it's, it's out there. Um, so somebody who is out there writing and anybody else who is having issues with the chat, please feel free to use the Q&A function if you're allowed um, access to that. So um, one of our participants asks, um, oh, forgive me, I lost it. One second. Is it the Q and A or the one that was in the chat? In, in the chat. So one of our colleagues. Did you see there was. Do you have a LGBTQ youth homeless shelter? Do mm -hmm. Yep. LGBTQ? Do you all have a LGBT, LGBTQ uh, youth homeless shelter? Do you work with LGBTQ plus homeless youth? So that's we for do. Foster Forward. Mm -hmm. We do work with um, LGBTQ plus uh, youth. Um, actually, the youth leader that I was just referring to um, is a part of that community. Um, but our we run a um, drop-in center for youth experiencing homelessness. Um, it is not specific to um, that community, but it is inclusive. Um, we have signs up. We have um, all policies and um, protocol to help um, everyone feel as comfortable as possible. The drop-in center here at Foster Forward runs three days a week. Um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 3, young people are able to come in and just as simple as chat with their peers about the struggles that they're dealing with. Um, we have computer computers in there. So if they're searching for employment um, or housing, someone, someone can pop in and help them. Um, but more importantly, we um, received funding from the Champlain Foundation to do a ton of renovations in our um, building to make it accessible. We have a shower. Um, so young people can shower and we also have a washer and dryer for them to be able to do laundry. Um, when they come in that drop-in center, we have a food pantry that is always replenished. Um, so young people can get a hot meal while they're here and take some things with them that are easy to heat or pack and store. Um, and um, we have a VOCA clinician on site that provides um, counseling and therapeutic support and also runs some groups during the time that that drop-in center is running. So. Um, Again, it's not specific to any community, um, but it's open to all mm -hmm. youth um, and young adults experiencing homelessness. I think too, an additional resource uh, that I know of is Silver Lining Mentoring, who um, do work specifically with young people involved in the foster care system or aging out of the foster care system. They are uh, LGBTQ plus friendly as well. Um, they have a very holistic model of supports. And the reason why I mentioned them um, is similar to Foster Forward. There's an opportunity um, for you to maybe reach out to folks who know what's going on and can hopefully, um, Michael, help you get uh, better, uh, more detailed and specific answers for young people in the LGBTQ plus community. There also is um, Pink and Black National. Um, who uh, focus on LGBTQ plus young people specifically and the trans community. Uh, we'll try to get pink and black in the chat for you. And the last one I can think of is also Massachusetts based because Silver Lining is based in Massachusetts, but I think um, they, they have expanded um, beyond Massachusetts. Um, and for Harvard Square, Harvard University has um, an organization called Y to Y. Um, and it is uh, a, like a, a youth run overnight shelter um, for young people as well. And I'll try to get you uh, Y to Y information from Cambridge, Massachusetts as well. And again, and my, my reason for sharing these resources is hopefully they have people there who are better experts at this than I. And so they can uh, provide you more information and context about how to get support for the young people that you're serving. Uh, so feel free, good people. Any other questions? Feel free I to put in the chat. I do see a Q and A question. Um, how do we move from transactional mentoring, for example, helping with resume writing, mm. um, to more transformative mentoring? Um, Great question. Meaning and purpose. Um, again, um, with our program, we're really focusing on the likes and the interests of, of the young people, and pairing them up with others that have those similar interests. Um, 
I wish I had prepared um, to share a link for one of the videos, um, but um, you can find it on YouTube or on our website of a young man that was paired with um, a, a person that was working in um, automotive. Um, and their initial um, connection was that he was going to do a work experience working on cars with this gentleman, um, and they developed a mentoring uh, mentor mentee relationship. Um, and they they worked on budgeting. They worked on um, him, you know, applying for different jobs and applying for different schools. Mm -hmm. um, he quit his job at one point because he his car broke down, and he was like, I don't know how I'm going to get to work. I live. Um, I live in this section of Rhode Island and I can't get to where my job is. Um, and his mentor, you know, worked with him on, you know, how do you address this, um, this issue without quitting your job? Um, so we also have that same philosophy to move away from the transactional. Um, and, and we actually say that as well, moving away from transactional um, interactions with young people to those things that are going to work to help them build on and really enrich their lives. Um, yeah. so that's a great question. I love that question. I think too, uh, like the, the practitioner, uh, like research practitioner side of me really thinks about our element of effective practice at Mentor. And that's like our cornerstone um, document that supports and provides evidence-based practices around what high quality mentoring can look like. And when we talk about like the transformative mentoring, I think it's really important to um, understand what the objectives of your mentoring program are. So if you are a career readiness program and, and you're looking uh, to either start a mentoring program or enhance your mentoring program, refining what the objective is and making it clear is super critical. Uh, so then, and then once that objective is clear, you can share that in your training and screening of mentors. Uh, you can share with them that we're not looking specifically for you know, a temporary connection. We're hoping that you and your mentee can foster something that is healthy uh, over time. And I think kind of sharing that at the beginning allows people to either opt in or opt out. Because the last thing we want are, you know, more adults who are uh, leaving young people's lives. Our research does show that you know, having a, a mentor mentee relationship end prematurely is more detrimental than um, not having a mentor at all right so having everybody understand what the expectations are what what the the time frame of the mentoring relationship is also really helps to build an opportunity for folks to be um, transformative it also reminds me uh bernadette to Kind of share a little bit about mentors work uh, place equity pledge and i was going i'm going to share a slide uh, and bernadette is still going to be here she's going to turn off her her um her camera for now and if you all have any more questions please feel free to put them in the in the chat function um or the q a function whichever one you have access to today and and kind of thinking about how do we help people uh, do more workplace mentoring and, and be more equitable? This is uh, the last thing we wanted to share with you all from Mentor um, is that Mentor had the opportunity to do our second ever workplace equity pledge. It launched um, in May and we just concluded it formally, but all the resources are still available on our website. And so what you're seeing here is uh, an opportunity to to see four different pledge and action items uh, in our in our campaign, and so we are encouraging people to advocate, uh, learn, elevate, and explore uh, what workplace uh, equity can look like. And so, uh, mentor, once you kind of go to our website specifically for this campaign, and you sign up and you take the pledge, all these links become live. And so, there's an opportunity for you to uh, really support the Youth Workforce Readiness Act, which is an opportunity for more career readiness uh, education to happen in our public uh, school systems, but also supports for our after school programs, career readiness programs, out of any of our out of school time programs with young people who are doing career readiness to receive a bit more funding. Uh, you can learn more about what it means to have a mentoring mindset. And so there is a complimentary opportunity to go through our mentoring mindset training right live on the webpage. Uh, with Elevate, you can um, elevate what 
workplace mentoring looks like and the benefits of uh, having a DEI strategy around mentoring um, in your workplace. And we have a one pager with citations on that for you all. And then last but not least, you can explore our resource, Becoming a Better Mentor, which is our newest resource and our first one ever speaking directly to mentors. Um, it's a 12 chapter resource for folks to consider you know, how do you make room for play? How do you enhance your cultural competency? Um, how do you support folks in a group setting or individual setting? So it's definitely worth checking out. And my colleague, um, George, put in the chat uh, the link to the Workplace Equity Pledge as well. So with that, we wanna conclude like our formal conversation with you all. Ask Bernadette if she wouldn't mind coming back online uh, for any uh, concluding questions that we are seeing in the Q and A function, um, and I think we got all of them, which is amazing. Um, and I think we want to say a proper thank you, then, Bernadette, to you and and for giving us your time and having this conversation with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here, and thanks to Foster Forward for all the work that they're doing. And then last but not least, I'd love for my colleagues, George and Mary Lauren, if they don't mind peeking their heads in online and waving. George and Mary Lauren are students from Duke University, and they are part of the Duke Engage program. And they have been working with Mentor National since June 1st. They have had a robust six-week uh, internship here with us, and they are the geniuses behind today's webinar. They have done all the work in thinking about the topic. They have applied their knowledge of what's been happening in their college career. Um, and they're both interested in public policy, which is amazing, and children, youth, and family policy. And they've applied all that learning to really lift up and elevate uh, an opportunity for Mentor National to meet Bernadette and Foster Ford. So thank you very much, Mary Lauren and George, for all of your hard work. Thank you so much for partnering with me this summer. I really appreciate it. And so with that, we wanna say thank you all so much. This concludes our webinar. This month happens to be our Career Readiness uh, Marketing Campaign at Mentor, as well as Disability Awareness Month. So please feel free to follow Mentor on social media at, at Mentor National uh, on most of the social media platforms. We wish you a great rest of your day and thanks so much for tuning in. Bye.